her a disintegrated notion. Beautiful, vibrant, alluring, spiritual, delicate, curvy, strong, captivating, intelligent, dedicated, intoxicating. That's her. That's her. Yet, gender inequality, poverty, family pressure, gender-based violence, early marriage and inadequate health options, amongst many other factors, are stopping her from achieving her full potential. About one in three of her, aged 15 to 49, have experienced physical violence and about one in four of her have experienced sexual violence from the age of 15 with 78 percent of her reporting that their husband or intimate partner was the perpetrator 32 percent of her are married before the age of 18 with 62% of her in their school going age missing school during their period because they lack the necessary sanitary wear. Her maternal mortality rate is one of the highest worldwide and HIV AIDS is particularly prevalent amongst her. Her income is generally lower than that of men accompanied by less job security. She makes up 60% of the population, yet she is underrepresented in decision-making position, discriminated against on the basis of her biology. Affected most by climate change, weather disasters and pandemics. The notion of what a woman is here is blurred between what society expects of and portrays her to be and what is real. Her current decisions are based on choosing between her well-being, both physical and emotional, and that of her families. Most times, she cannot have both. Establishing an equal footing in terms of education, health, governance, as well as within financial domains, should be prioritized to allow her advancement in the country. That starts with government being accountable to the women and youth who make up the majority of the population. Pro-female products which facilitate her success and eventually her participation in the country's development are a must. Sadly, initiatives and policies which promote her to decision-making positions very rarely transform the systems fundamental prejudices that create a gap between her formal and actual power. Isolated strategies aimed at empowering her do not necessarily change the perceptions held by those in power of her and her capabilities. Changes in perceptions of her are only partly achieved by investing in her education and ability to generate an income. Efforts aimed at economic empowerment and on promoting her to strategic positions overlook the important role of her organizing to challenge and undo beliefs and systems that prevent her from achieving equality 
in all spheres of her life. Patriarchal attitudes at community level continue to be the most significant hurdle for her and the system. Historically, she has been denied authority over her own education, health and reproductive rights and has had limited control over material assets. Research highlights how the colonial legacy of gender inequality on traditional African systems and beliefs continues to perpetuate male dominance and power at the expense of her rights and access to resources. She has borne the brunt of globalization and privatization where unemployment and inequality tend to affect her most adversely. Her entrepreneurship and empowerment continue to be key focus areas of development initiatives and action in Africa. Entrepreneurship is increasingly hailed as one of the cornerstones of women's empowerment and overall economic growth on the continent, addressing structural barriers to her empowerment. Warning, 
to do with us. Bishop, what happened last time? I'm not risking my job for a girl I don't even know. If you want to, then go ahead. I'm surprised I haven't seen you here before. Yeah, I just moved a few days ago. Where from? I was at the university. All right, guys, water break's over. Let's take it from the top. Tell me about it later. Here you go. You must be thirsty. Thank you. I can't believe I lost mine. No worries. Wouldn't want to leave you hanging after you worked so hard today. Yeah, I hate to be a bother. No bother at all. God, forget how hot it gets back here. Yeah, why is that? Never figured it out. You know, you don't have to keep that sweaty thing on if you don't want to. If I'm good, I'll just shower when I get home. You sure? Trust me. I've worked with dancers so long, I've seen it all before. Um, I'm sure. You're doing really well with the choreo. I enjoy watching you dance. Thank you. I'm glad to have found work so soon after the Later. Something like that? There's something really special about you. I knew it as soon as I saw you. I'm sure you get that all the time. Well, maybe not. I see something. I could take you far if you let me. I think I should get going. What's the rush? 
We're just having a conversation. Well, maybe you should take this thing off since you're so uncomfortable. I should go. Take it. Take it off! That's it. Just relax. I've done this before. No, he's not. I'm just gonna have to sit over for him. Are you good to do it alone? Yeah, it's just a dress yourself. I've done this before.
All right, hello and welcome to the first panel discussion of the Bokola Film Festival. This festival is brought to you by Magama Network in conjunction with Accountability Lab Zimbabwe as a sort of final project, one of the final projects of the Film Fellowship. Now, this fellowship's aim was to bring young and new filmmakers from across the provinces of Zimbabwe who are passionate about accountability and social justice issues to create a short film based on issues that are particularly pertinent to them. So today's topic is why women and girls should be at the center of policy. And we are looking at the film Hadassah by Salima from Mutare. Her, A Disintegrated Notion by Sky Sebata from Victoria Falls. And Cruel Joke by Connor Zefflin from Harare. And on the panel today, we have the ever hardworking Titi Madoda, who is a TV and film production specialist, just absolutely amazing. And we have the hardworking Mandy Tembo, who is a menstrual health specialist and a sexual and reproductive health rights advocate. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And thank you to the filmmakers over here. And just start from a point of gratitude. Thank you to the filmmakers for making this art. Thank you to the two of you who do work towards us in completely different fields, but everybody here has, has impacted somebody's life and our own lives. We're here for the betterment. So to start with, it would seem like the films, the three films sort of touched on the topic of culture. So we want to look at policy, not just at a broad level, a national level, like in terms of legislature, but even just like public sphere and then private in the home just simple things like how we relate, how women relate to each other and how we, the rest of society relates to women just in the home. So culture, sometimes it seems like it's not something for the women to particularly enjoy, but it is at all times they're expected to enforce it, even if they're not enjoying it at all. Um, so Mandy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that culture is rich and important. I definitely think that culture is something to be celebrated. I agree that often culture is used as a tool to sort of manipulate um, and control the narratives and experiences of women in a lot of cultures across the globe. And I think what this, these films show and what we're talking about today is how there's a shift in culture. It's not something that's stagnant. It can change over time. And it should not be used as a tool to sort of tell women or people how to live their lives, but it should really be a celebration of what you bring to the sort of global melting pot of what people do and how people behave. Um, and I think particularly the one film around, uh, I think it was Hadasha who said, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And the only explanation they had was, it's our culture. That's really not enough because things change over time. It needs to serve the people, not to control them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really good. I completely agree with her. I think um, over time, culture, what we deem as culture has changed because of worldwide migration, travel, intermarriages, mm -hmm. um, and just education. And just from an, an aspect of growing up in front of the TV, it allows us to ask questions. You know, you're like, okay, but why am I made to do this instead of choosing to do that? Mm -hmm. And I think... Um, when you look at the films that um, the fellows made, I find that it is so important to actually shape narrative that actually helps with policy development because there's certain things that, yes, culture should be celebrated and um, not forced. It shouldn't be used for manipulation or for control, but to be celebrated. And if there are aspects of culture that don't fit in, let's have the conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's have the people people actually talk about it and see how best we can go forward because we can't keep sticking to the same things. Yeah. Rather find ways of celebrating them than feeling like they're being forced or lorded over you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just going to say in summary, like culture doesn't negate choice, yeah. right? In anything. It shouldn't. Yeah. It definitely shouldn't. Yeah. And in Hadassah, Slima's film Hadassah, there's that intersection between sort of modernity, what people view as something like Western imports versus our traditional culture. And she's saying, well, no, I wanted to go to school. Um, and the answer saying, but you let her go to school and now she won't do X, Y, Z, that's expected of her. So that just throw out all the school. She did that, but that's not really important. And excuse me. And 
she she's at the intersection of both of those things. It's not one or the other. It's different for the aunt who never had the opportunity to go to school, or for you know an, an uncle who's never have to, <laughs> never gonna have this labia touch because he doesn't have any. So for Salima, um, how was that bringing forth that important discussion? between the intersection between modernity and culture and a woman's body being sort of a battleground for that and how do we go forth in asserting our voices and inserting our choice because as Mandy said culture shouldn't negate choice but you are not at the top of the food chain in these traditional family structures so how do you go about that taking from Hadassah's example okay so um first of all I um I think that um, an awareness to for this whole thing to stop will be fine um, because um, you know we have a lot of advocates and doctors and people who are in um, in high places who are still doing these things like elongating labia yeah, uh, because they feel like it's a part of of the culture, you have to do it. Like women do things for men, it's for sexual gratification. So um, I just think that um, I don't know how an awareness um, should be done, but I feel like it's it's happening. Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> it's okay. It's happening everywhere, and um, women are toothless. Uh, they say. The, the other thing on social media and then the next thing they are going on to Chinamali doing all of that. So um, people really need to be educated about this. That uh, you don't really need to be doing that for a man especially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's bad. It is. It really, really is. Um... And that's the that was the theme again in several of the films that you have to do it for the man. So in her, a disintegrated notion, there was some amazing imagery that that confluence between visual art, like still life, and then spoken word. And in the images where the woman was there, it's either she's laboring and the man's just standing there, and if they're together, he's holding her body, sort of manipulating her into into a position and that was just so beautiful to see because the the power dyna is just not it's just not in your hands um so a question a question to Ska Sebata um in doing this film how but like besides policy what else can we do just on a home front to not constantly be subjugated and manipulated physically and psychologically and socially by these external power dynamics and forces? Ska, are you with us? A uh, note of uh, okay. what Titi said. Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, I could. we can hear you. Okay, um, what Titi was saying that um, there's so much exposure now and people, there's rural and urban migration and all that. But you'll find I live in a rural community and um, the things that I see don't correlate to the things that people believe are happening within an urban setting. So when we speak of there's so much happening, we're speaking for a certain, um, like an elite group of people who actually have the comfort we don't have that. Sorry, we're losing you a bit there. Women to to see more than the surroundings. The end. Are you losing me? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. Um, you were saying that people don't necessarily have the comfort and ability. Yes. I am. Um, um. It's 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 it's. Yes, I don't have the comfort to actually migrate sometimes or to know what else is out there. And that's something that's very lacking within rural communities, that exposure for young women more out there, know their rights even. 
young people in rural communities don't have that because no one is really catering for them. They don't have access to internet or technology that everyone else might have. So they don't even have access to radio where they can access this information. So it's up to us, those who have the exposure, to go into those rural communities and teach people what should be done, how to um, associate and be part of and be integrated into the system that everyone claims that we are all a part of and we know when that actually isn't the case. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And Mandy, I know you do a lot of uh, site visits and going into these communities. And Sitsi, what I love about like having the two of you together is the confluence of we've used filmmaking we've used this as a now as a tool to get the messaging out there because that's what it is it's stories that's what we you know people will say oh women gossip all the time we're not we're sharing stories of trauma is most of what's happening um so with filmmaking and with what you do do you do you see the impact in your day-to-day -day life and not just um in the productions that you produce and the stories of the productions you produce, but also in the manner in which you do it behind the scenes, the structures that you have in setting up a production, do they leak out into influencing girls and women to have more agency? I would say it depends. Um, I think having traveled around, um, there is still a very huge difference. So I, I, I do agree with Ska. There's a very um, big difference between what we term as education in Africa and what we term as education out there. And yeah. I think there is a difference between what the, the norms in the urban culture and in the rural culture. But, you know, some of the things that I think are very important is we, we, we cannot stop um, because we think that there are norms that haven't changed. I think we need to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And with that, I think the more we build and the more we um, create, the more we change the narrative, the more we reach areas like um, like, like rural settings. And I think even um, with the work that, that she does, if we can create tools like films that are not hard sell, mm -hmm. they are more soft sell because what I've found in the industry is people relate to people. Yeah. So when you have a film, you know, um, some of the things that you do, the way you position a camera, um, if you know the camera is higher, it shows a, a level of authority. If it's lower, it shows a level of inferiority. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you position the camera? How do you soft sell into people's minds, into educating people? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll give you two examples that have happened recently. Um, you know the issue of R. Kelly? Yes when they did the, the, the film about surviving R. Kelly, that actually helped speed up the process of um, his conviction. Mm -hmm. But that was through film, mm -hmm. through, you know, bringing out the emotions because we all loved R. Kelly, but when we started seeing people actually speak and hearing their hearts, we felt what they felt. Uh, what I love in Zimbabwe recently, I watched um, Ja Preza did the Norondo series. Mm -hmm. It's music videos, guys. Everyone loves music. But when you watch it, you relate. Mm -hmm. And I think, if anything, that's what I would love to see more happening in terms of changing narrative, in terms of bringing in education, but softly. Yeah. You know, not hard sale, because a lot of people can become very defensive when you're like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do, or this is not what you're supposed to do. But when you sell it through film, there's a way that you can do it. And if we can get more women in film, they tell the story from their perspective and it helps people like the people that Scar's talking about in rural settings who don't have access to these things. Yeah. Change the traditional culture with popular culture tools. Yeah. Somewhat. Yeah. I would yeah. just add to that to say like even a platform like this is incredibly powerful, right? The people who are watching and listening are going to be able to have a conversation amongst themselves and maybe bring that conversation back to their home, back to their office, uh, back to their parents. And that's incredibly powerful as well, right? That we're create, amplifying the voices of everyday women around the globe and that voice is adding to the narratives or the conversations that are happening in private and public spheres that will influence policy and change things globally. Mm -hmm. So like whatever small thing you're doing, continue to do that yeah. because it adds up. It does. It, it really does. Um, 
add up and that's I know it's part of the conversation people always say that women have to use their soft power I often oh sorry does someone want to say something the film fellows also please do feel free to just sort of jump in as we as we have the discussion if you have any questions and this goes for the audience as well please do leave comments please do leave questions just for the panelists or to just throw out in the universe as part of the frustrations of existing just please uh do engage like we're saying every little bit helps every little cry sigh everything um so um, um i just to say something um mm -hmm. to what city said um uh, in that it's important to integrate um the people that um are also being spoken about like i felt it was very important for me to um uh, have young women within the rural communities that i live and work with be a part of the film as the models they'd never done that before um and the setting was something that they were you to and they and they, and they understood it you'd find were crowding around and to see because it was something that was relatable to them and when you convey your message using uh, methods that are uh, relatable to people the message comes across much better mhm mm and that's important because oftentimes when we try to do work to help people will say why is nobody talking about this it's like no people are just not particularly you and you don't want to talk over the voice of the people whose voice you're trying to amplify it's not about you saying you using your voice you are amplifying the voice of others um and i really like just to go back to what tc said about f the way we frame things in storytelling and not just in storytelling but it tells us what the focus is if something as simple as a camera angle or the way people tell a joke or the way people share images all of it and what i particularly loved um kona in cruel joke is that a lot of the times people will put in a rape scene and it's for shock factor but this wasn't for shock factor this was the point of the story but you didn't visually make it the point the point was her processing the trauma after that and that was a really particularly important tool and i would you like to speak more about where you focused your where you focused your perspective and what you thought the most important thing to bring out in your storytelling was Can are you with us? Um there we go. I really wanted to focus on the what she, Sorry Connor we can't Sorry. hear you. Can you start again? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um what I wanted to focus on was how she felt in the scene, not necessarily what was happening to her. Mhm. Mm um trying to life uh the dissociation that she felt and um not necessarily make it like a like a rape scene like typically see to be um ambiguous just um a trauma that was important for me to know okay kana do you want to try turn off the camera and then just use the audio maybe it'll use less bandwidth use it for shock factor like you said i wanted to really take you into her head in that moment where she the door closed i wanted to focus on in the scene wasn't um necessarily the act of what happened behind the door i wanted to focus on what she felt and um the door closing in itself is symbolic because she closes off when that um when the trauma happens i wanted to take you into a feeling of dissociation that she went into in that moment and then when the door opens again it's a feeling of emptiness that i wanted to convey mhm mm that's particularly important especially with issues like rape because people focus on the physical details and that's not what's important what's important is that's how i felt you didn't feel like it was an assault you didn't feel like it was harassment but that's not what's important and 
you highlighted from the beginning of the film, the other dancers are just sort of saying, well, that's not my problem because I'm also, you know, I don't want to lose my job. The power dynamics socially just force you to not be able to do something. But we need to increase community intervention and accountability, but also without putting ourselves in danger. And Mandy, what have you found in your work ways where community intervention has, has helped in, improve the situation? Yeah, I think a lot of the work that intervention work does, even though it's community based, is t is uh, directed at an individual, mm -hmm. right? So you might be talking around uh, reproductive health and talking about family planning, or you know, my specialty being menstrual health. And there's a lot of engagement with uh, the one on one with the menstruator, with the young woman. Mm -hmm. But what we found is it's not nearly as effective as if you engage with her and her community. Because uh -huh. once you leave the intervention, you are bombarded with the societal norms, with what happens in your home, with the opinions of your partner, your caregiver, your parent. Um, and so the intervention really needs to filtrate through all those different mm -hmm. spheres. Um, and I think, you know, applicable to that film is that you might do a lot of, you know, empowerment and talking about uh, gender-based violence, but really in order to nim take it from its like, bud, you need to engage all, um, all players or actors in the act. Mm -hmm. So the perpetrator, um, the survivor, the community that's observing it, because a lot of the times it's happening in the open, right? With that, with the cruel joke video, it, uh, with the cruel joke uh, film, you saw that everyone could see what was mm -hmm. happening, but they let it happen. To some extent, because there was a protectiveness of themselves as individuals, but yeah. also because it's something they've they've normalized as a viewing point. Um, and so the engagement needs to happen at all spheres and make sure that you are uh, you, taking it in context. What is a cultural understanding of why these things happen? Mm -hmm. um, what does the perpetrator think around power dynamics? I think this this film, along with a lot of other examples across the globe, really tie in the sort of fragile masculinity to um, violence against women. And understanding that chain of events is a way for us to go in terms of intervention for prevention mm -hmm. as opposed for reform. So yeah, I think just understanding the context and addressing it uh, holistically as opposed to just addressing the individual. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, and what I loved about all three films as we're talking about this power dynamic and having intervention for prevention instead of rather than reform and upholding this this uh, fragility um, is the women are upholding it. And in all of the films, none of the women were having a good time, Inclu including the ones that weren't even the point of the story. None of the dancers were comfortable because already it was an environment. So just because they didn't weren't particularly subjected to the actual act of rape does not mean that they weren't an environment of um, being harassed uh, in Hadassah, the Tete herself, when she had to go through that, she didn't enjoy it. And she's now feeling the pressure of trying to enforce this cultural rule that she doesn't really agree with in, um, in her. The woman is doing all of this labor, the children are knowing that, you know, I can grow up and people can say I'm an individual, but I'm just gonna have to grow up and continue this work. So it just, like you're saying, the solution, I guess, yeah, it is in holistically, having the interventions everywhere because it's all very well to have somebody come in and you feel like the day is saved but we need to on a community level and permeate through every single level i guess is what we're saying but um, contextually so right because mm -hmm. we're not trying to sort of impose a new normal right but really trying to understand what is a normal that is balanced and is um, beneficial to all parties, uh -huh. right? Like you said, in all of the narratives, whether you're upholding the societal norm or you're subjected to it, no one is really enjoying what's happening. And so it needs to be addressed in a way that's positive to everyone involved mm -hmm. and that the you know whatever change you're making is one that is beneficial to all as opposed to an imposition of a new normal yeah. that might not benefit the community or an imposition of uh, something that they don't want already. So mm. yeah, understanding the context and you making sure that everybody's happy um, yeah. and it addresses a problem from all the different levels. Yeah, And I think that's a misconception people have that, oh, we're just focusing on these women issues. These, It's like, no, everyone, it's an everyone, everyone, issue. everyone benefits everyone, yeah. because it, it trickles issue. down within the ecosystem of our cultures and everything. Yeah. And I think I like the way Ska spoke about involving 
the different people that mm -hmm. are in these communities, just involving different people in shaping that narrative. Uh -huh. And I think that's so important. Um, one of the things I loved about um, um, Connor's film was there's different themes that come out of there, you know. Mm. Am I my sister's keeper? Should I be my sister's keeper? You know, um, that fear, you know, you can see that something's happening, but there's that, like a, a fear to, you know, and you find that someone will relate to that. And mm -hmm. then also seeing little um, things like how triggers, trauma triggers. So like she hears, um, as she's walking out, she hears someone saying, I've done this before. And that's like a, a, a trigger of a trauma that she's faced. Yeah. So, you know, also finding ways of um, having a story within a story mm -hmm. or having um, a narrative within a narrative. So even like in the work that Mandy does, she's doing more, um, 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 she, she may be just covering uh, menstrual health, but there's so many other factors around it, which some are education, some are just empowering, you know, so we can't look at one thing. We actually have to look at it as a whole. And I, I think I do agree with that. Yeah. Definitely. Well, it's, it's a pity we don't have more time because <laughs> it's definitely such a huge and inter interconnected discussion. But like we're saying, that's the point of it. If we center yeah. women and girls, you can affect so many other more issues. You use storytelling and filmmaking as a tool to get the message out, employ the people who actually are affected by the situations in giving your messaging and have it as a community level intervention. Don't just do individual spots because at the end of the day it's the, ch the culture can change we need everybody to be accommodated for and everybody to feel welcome and safe and you should start by listening to the people who don't feel safe which is the women and the girls right so thank you both to both of you for joining us and giving your very unique um, professional perspectives and just the confluence of the two different things and thank you a million times to the filmmakers who brought these topics in uh, such a special way. There was three completely different films, but you managed to get a running narrative through all three of them and each of them had their individual stories. So that concludes our first panel discussion for the Wokola Film Festival. Why women and girls should be at the center of the policy, of policy making. So please do engage in the comments um, when you watch the films, any, comments you have like we were saying just make noise about these issues because people think that it's an isolated event or it's something that happens on and off and it's not it's just everyday life for some of us and we can use film to do that make the pop culture integrate into the traditional culture thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you for the next one <laughs>